Okay, I want to talk subtools, and I want to talk subtools in a, a in a very simple way, no complexity to it uh, yet. There's a lot of ways to get complexity, uh, and so what I'll do is take a look at um, one of my models, as long as it. Uh, doesn't take too long to load. So we're going to take a look at Angelina, which you'll have seen if you, uh, in the imagery for this course. Uh, there was the uh, the face with the flowing hair, and uh, that really explains the basic, simple purpose of subtools. Give it one second to load. This is one of the problems with undo history is it always takes uh, time. Oh, I'm, I'm reworking the hair here, uh, reworking the flow. So uh, let's get it to the original and extra crispy. Select up, move up. I always forget which one. All right, so in essence, we have a very simple subtool division. Okay, we have the body. We have the dress. I have eyelashes. I don't know if you can see those guys, but she's got eyelashes that are separate geometry. Her hair is a one subtool. And then she has this little piece of hair that I just couldn't get the right way, so I had to cut and paste. And, uh, and so that's a separate subtool. This is what subtools should be used for, separate parts like this. And the reason why, and the only reason why, is polygon count. Okay, and that's that's going to get us it's going to start us off with the primary reason why do subtools exist do they exist so that i have this really simple way to organize wherever her dress is or i really just want eyelashes to be called eyelash so i can select them in a maya outliner is that why no absolutely not because what Pixelogic would prefer is that you use groups to select things. For example, I'm not sure if this is still the case. Let me check. I'm going to go into solo mode. Solo mode means that the selected subtool will be the only visible subtool. I'm going to turn on polyframe and look. Those eyeballs are separate. Not only are they separate, they're all messed up. But they're separate. And I act I work with them via polygroups. Technically speaking, this dress could be there as well. But the only reason to have separate subtools is your polygon count. So subtools equal a multiplier. If you're ever explaining this to somebody, this is a really fancy, this is a really easy way to sound like you know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> okay. Subtools are a multiplier for your polygon count. If my computer can handle, let's say, 5 million polys, If it can handle 5 million polygons, well, you know, that's good. That's going to get me somewhere. But if she was a full figure, you know, she's going to be maybe 20 million polygons. So how do we get 20 million polygons? 
This is a real life problem. I'll exp I'll, I'll uh, tell you the history here in a second because I was uh, Subtools was one of the things that um, that I was around for, and uh, it's got a great story because uh, Chris Costa was the one wanting us to do something. He had a problem that we were trying to solve, and Subtools came out of that. But let's talk about this first. So, five million polygons is all my system can handle. That means using subtools and the way they work, this one subtool can be 5 million, the next can be 5 million, 5 million, 5 million, 5 million, 5 million. All of them can be 5 million if that's my polygon count limit. This does start to decay. You can't have 100 subtools that are all 5 million. There is a, an overhead that each one of these guys adds to the equation. So it does cost a little bit to have the subtools in existence. You could easily have four subtools that have 5 million polygons. You could comfortably have six. You'd run into problems at 10. But who knows what's the most important thing for your hardware to have in terms of ZBrush? People ask this all the time. What, do I, what, what kind of computer do I need to have for ZBrush? All right, some people are saying RAM, and that's really important. But what else? There's actually a very significant battle, you know, going on in the industry, you could say. Everybody else went one direction, and ZBrush went the other direction. Not 64-bit or 32-bit, although that was part of it. It's your processor. It's your processor. You can see it if you go into preference. Where did they put it? Now, performance. You can see all the stuff multi draw, multi threaded, um, quick and dirty, multi threaded steps, max threads, test multi threading, priority setting, all of that. It's your processor. And not just your processor, how many cores does your processor have? And there was a moment, there was a scary moment, when NVIDIA was starting to beat Intel. If the graphics card beats your processor, technically speaking, ZBrush lost. Because ZBrush bet on the processor. That's my understanding of it. It bet on your processor and your RAM. Your graphics card is irrelevant. And why would they not care about your graphics card? And this is really important. This, this question, why do they not care about your graphics card? That's really important for us to understand what PixLogic's thinking, what their direction is. Anybody know why they would not care about the video card? Why wouldn't they make that a, a, a priority for them? When Maya, Max, XSI, Marma set, all these guys use uh, the graphics card. Matthew says the cost of them, no real-time rendering. Keep in mind, ZBrush is real-time rendering a million polygons right now at 60 frames a second. As fast as any game. More. Faster. So it's not real-time rendering. David hits on it, and that I wanted to make an issue of this because you have to. You have, it's important for me to communicate that ZBrush is about freedom, and I know that's a marketing term, and that's kind of you know hokey, but I'm not kidding when I say it is about freedom. They have a vision of breaking down walls and making the using the computer as a tool to unlimit you 
to allow you to create in a whole new way. The reason why Pixelogic still exists when big companies like Autodesk have acquired other companies in that space, have showed an interest in doing something, the reason why Pixelogic still exists is because they have passion and vision and this is what they do. They live this. They, they live and breathe that artistic freedom. You cannot, you can never win against a zealot and Pixelogic is, is just a zealot for freedom. They are the, the company and the people who want to push boundaries as much as possible. And a graphics card is, it's, what, I mean, you go to Best Buy, you buy a computer, and now you got to go buy a graphics card, and then you got to configure the graphics card, and, uh, you know, it's got to work with this company, with that thing, and they've got this driver. I mean, that's not freedom. You're basically roped into a graphics card. That's fine if you don't care about freedom, and all you're doing is trying to create something, you know, kind of average and okay. But it doesn't work for freedom. And that's where Pixelogic excels, is in that vision that the computer should disappear. It doesn't exist. What exists is your screen, your Wacom pin, and ZBrush. I don't even think about my computer. All right. I got lost a little bit. But that freedom is really what is informing uh, ZBrush. And it's key to getting an understanding of subtools if we segue our way back and out of <laughs> out of our zealot uh, spreading the good word nature uh, subtools allow your computer to do more with the same amount that it has that's the key you do more with the same thing that you've got and that's the coding that they did they they, you know, you have to also know that uh, ZBrush has, it, it controls so much. I mean, as far as I can remember, it has its own memory management routines. It dominates things. It dominates your computer and takes as much control so that it can relieve you from thinking about stuff as possible. And uh, in terms of subtools, being able to do more with the same computer you have, that was kind of a coup for 